Okay, so good day to all of you. So we're already in Chapter 9 of the Systems Analysis and Design, and it is titled Data Design. So let's start with our discussion to know what is data design all about. So the chapter objectives explain file-oriented systems and how they differ from database management systems, explain data design terminology, including entities, fields, common fields, records, files, tables, and key fields. Describe data relationships, draw an entity relationship diagram, define cardinality, and use cardinality notation. Explain the concept of normalization. And the next is explain the importance of codes and describe various coding schemes. And then explain data warehousing and data mining. Differentiate between logical and physical storage and records and explain data control measures. So for the introduction for this chapter, this begins with a review of data design concepts and terminology, then discusses file-based systems and database systems, including web-based databases. And then this chapter concludes with a discussion of data storage and access, including strategic tools such as data warehousing and data mining, physical design issues, logical and physical records, data storage formats, and data controls. So for the data design concepts is we have this so-called data structures. So each file or table contains data about people, places, things, or events that interact with the information system. So for data design, we have two types of data structures. So we have the file-oriented system and the database management system or the DBMS. So let's tackle the file-based um, processing. So file processing can be efficient and cost-effective in certain situations. If we're just going to use, for example, storing files that does not have, you do not need to share, or there is no access from the outside just for um, um, getting the list of the names, for example, for the customer file and transaction file, and it does not require extensive uh, data manipulation or data access. For example, your um, your grade, your, uh, your grade for all of your subjects, um, for, pro for file processing, it will not be possible because because uh, your grades will depend on the number of your instructors and the grade that will be given to you. So uh, that is the, the disadvantage of file processing. It's not used for um, database management. So what, uh, what are the potential problems is we have the data redundancy. So why data redundancy? For example, if you have this file and one of your coworkers also want, uh, also, um, want to have that type of file, so file processing is not centralized. So there can be a, a repetitive um, 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 frequencies of data in the file processing. And then next also is we have data integrity. For example, again, you have, uh, you have your coworker. He or she has a separate copy. You modified your copy. And then he or she modified her own copy. And then if you're going to um, integrate it, so which is more updated and which is correct? So, so that is the problem with file processing, the data integrity. And it has a rigid data structure. But still, file processing is still used in, in, of course, in the business, such as what are these various types of files. We have the master file, table file, transaction file, work file, security file, and history file. Okay, since because of the disadvantage, of a more uh, disadvantages of file uh, processing, so there is this database systems. So we have the so-called DBMS or the Database Management System is a collection of tools, features, and interfaces that enable users to add, update, manage, access, and analyze the contents of a database. So the main advantage of a DBMS is that it offers timely, interactive, and flexible data access. Again, let's return to the example. Um, accessing all your grades that is uploaded by all of your instructors. The instructors um, uploaded the grades per class. Then how is it possible that if you want to know your grades uh, per your instructor, it will be, uh, it will be um, extracted from those 
um, class roster with grades that is uh, uploaded. And then all of your grades are, uh, based on your request, it will all be displayed. It is, again, it is not possible if you're going to use a file processing system, but it's possible if it, uh, the one that is using, the data structure that it is using is the database system. So we have another example here. So we have a sales database. So this sales database, it's not just for, of course, for the sales office, but then as you can see, offices or other system can access the database, such as inventory system, accounting system, production system, and order system. For example, for the order system, if if a customer orders a product, so it will be reflected to the sales database base, and then the inventory system will update how many stocks are still available for that product. So database is centralized compared to file processing. So uh, for database, it is an enterprise-wide um, data management because all of the systems can also access that database and if there are any changes coming from or being done by the different system it will be reflected uh, in the database so just for this example we have the sales database and then is uh, then these are the advantages of database systems is we have scalability so again scalability you can add data more data depending on the uh, size of your servers so uh, there's no problem with the scalability of the data and the database itself. And then better support for client server systems because, of course, that is the, uh, the, the purpose of database systems. There is a centralized uh, data repository or the data uh, DBMS, the one who's going to take care of that uh, data repository. And even there, there are clients are going to access the data simultaneously. There will be no problem. And the next is we have the economy of scale. So it is related to scalability. It is easier to upgrade, to expand, to, to make the, the data repository bigger. And then we have flexible data sharing. So as you can already see the advantages of using database system. Again, example for your grades. Of course, your grade, your grade uh, set of grades will be different from your classmates because of the power of the database management system. And then we also have the enterprise-wide application. As you can see, a database can be accessed by many of the systems inside a company. So for it to uh, maintain the functionality and the, the robustness of your date, uh, database is we have a database administrator or DBM, DBA rather. So a DBA actually, uh, it's very crucial because he or she is the one who's going to manage and, uh, and, of course, maintain the database. And, of course, since database has a very um, a critical data, a very crucial data, so DBA must be very um, um, ethical that he will not be tempted, for example, if a rival company with the same nature of business will going to offer uh, a, a bigger salary uh, for the exchange of the database of the com uh, of the competitor or of the company itself. So the DBA must have a very strong and moral ethical values. And another advantage of uh, a database system is it has a stronger standards, stronger standards for security and for uh, for accessing. Okay, next is we have the DBMS components. So interfaces for users database administrators, and related systems. For users, they are using the query language or the query by example or QBE or the SQL or the structured query language. And then for the database administrators, so a DBA is responsible for DBMS management and support. As I've already discussed, a database administrator has a crucial responsibility and a very um, important responsibility for the DBMS management and support. So next is we have for related information systems for the DBMS components. So a DBMS can support several related information systems that provide input to and require specific data from the DBMS. 
And then no human intervention is required for two-way communication. So, for example, if you're going to access your grades, it does not require an additional manpower to sort the, the grades that you are requested. Um, there is no human intervention if you're going to request data for, for example, for, for your grades or for any information that you want to the database. Okay, next is we have the data manipulation language. So, a data manipulation language or DB, DML controls database operations including storing, retrieving, updating, and deleting data. And then we have schema. So, the complete definition of a database including descriptions of all fields, tables, and relationships is, is called a schema. We can also define one or more subschemas. So, next is we have the physical data repository. So, for data dictionary, is transformed into a physical data repository which also contains the schema and subschemas. So, the physical repository might be centralized or distributed at several locations. So, for connectivity of databases, as we have ODBC, the Open Database Connectivity, or the JDBC, the Java Database Connectivity. So, we've already, actually what we're discussing or the previous is just the traditional database design. Then, because of the proliferation of internet, we have already uh, evolved from traditional database design to web-based database design. Actually, uh, accessing your grades or requesting your grades, it, it is a web-based database design. So, what are the characteristics of web-based design? So, these are uh, one, two, three, four, five, six characteristics of a typical web-based database design. Okay, so first characteristic is we have global access. So, the internet enables worldwide access using existing infrastructure and standard telecommunications protocols. Because, of course, if it is web-based, of course, it needs an internet connection. So, all the people around the world can access your database unless, of course, you have a user ID and password for authorization of accessing the database. Okay, next is we have ease of use. So, web browsers provide a familiar interface that is user-friendly and easily learned. So, of course, why it is easy to use? Because by accessing the web-based uh, database, you just only need a browser and, of course, an internet connection in which all of uh, all of us for web browsers we are familiar with the skill of using a web browser next is we have multiple platforms web-based design is not dependent on a specific combination of hardware or software all that is required is a browser and an internet connection so multiple platforms if you're using web-based database design it does not care if the device accessing the database is a window based is a Macintosh-based uh, computer, or is it a Android, uh, Android-based smartphone, or um, an iOS-based phone? So it does not care. The only thing that uh, requirement for web-based database design is, of course, it is already said. All that is required is a browser and and internet connection. Okay. Next characteristic is cost effectiveness. Initial investment is relatively low because the internet serves as the communication framework. Users require only a browser and web-based systems do not require powerful workstations. Flexibility is high because numerous outsourcing options exist for development, hosting, maintenance, and system support. It is, again, cost-effective because you don't need to configure your own communication network or build your own communication network. And of course, Users, as long as your device has an internet connection and a browser, you can already connect to the data, uh, web-based database. And then, of course, flexibility is high because there are uh, numerous outsourcing uh, options for the development of the web-based uh, web database or for the hosting. You do not need to buy your own server. So hosting and maintenance come hand-in-hand. And of course, system support. It's easier if it is a web-based database. Okay, the only drawback characteristic of uh, web-based design is security issues. 
So security is an universal issue, but internet connectivity raises special concerns. So what are these special concerns? Of course, if your database is, of course, web-based database design, you must remember that it's open for, for the uh, attack of hackers, for the exploitation of, uh, of course, of hackers. May it be a, uh, of, uh, and any hackers who just only wants to play or, or are, for example, exhort money from the company. So that's very important. You have to consider the security issues. And then this can be addressed with a combination of good design, software that can protect the system and detect intrusion, stringent rules for passwords and other user a user identification and vigilant users and managers. So if you're going to have a web-based database design, you really have to consider or strengthen the security of your database. Because of course, um, if your database is easily exploited or easily been hacked, of course, by the hackers, by, uh, by anyone, uh, by any hacker. So uh, it means that your security, you have a security loophole. And actually, it's a very uh, not a good impression about your company because you can't protect your data online. Okay, next is we have adaptability issues. So the internet offers many advantages in terms of access, connectivity, and flexibility. So migrating a traditional database design on the web, however, can require design modification, additional software, and some added expense. So adaptability issue, what if, for example, you have an existing traditional database design and you want to convert it into a web-based database? So there, you might encounter a problem with regards to adaptability because it is stated here, it requires design modification, additional software, and of course, because of this additional it's added expense, so, if you are a company that's still, uh, that, you, that you are considering, will it be traditional database design or web-based? So, you have to decide early on if it is traditional, it should be traditional web design. And if it is web-based database design, then it's better that um, be a web-based database than a traditional database and then you're going to convert to web-based uh, database later because it will incur more costs. Okay, so we have the internet terminologies as a review. So the term web browser, it is a software application for accessing information on the World Wide Web. Of course, the popular web browsers, Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, Microsoft Edge, or any other web browsers found in your smartphones that is already a web browser. Okay, next is we have web page as the definition. It is a document commonly written in HTML that is viewed in an internet browser. So, of course, it is a document um, document that can only be viewed by using an internet browser or a web browser. Okay, next is we have the HTML or the Hypertext Markup Language. It is the most basic building block of the web because most of the websites that, that are being developed they are written in HTML still. There is, uh, but of course, there are newer versions for HTML such as HTML5 or I don't know if there is already a more, up, uh, a more updated than HTML5. But HTML continues to evolve to include or to enrich the content of the web. Okay, next is we have the tags. These are like keywords which defines how web browser will format and display the contents. So for tags, actually tags are included in HTML. For example, you want your text to be um, underlined, to be a bold face type. So you, you, will, you should use tags. And then next is we have the web server. It is a software and hardware that uses HTTP and other protocols to respond to client requests made over the World Wide Web, or the triple W, so a web server. Okay, so web servers, this, of course, uh, they're the ones loading the website and its web pages. Okay, next is we have the website. 
It is a set of related web pages located under a single domain name, typically produced by a single person or organization. So for a website, for example, we have a e-commerce website, for example, lazada.ph. So that is already your website. So Lazada has, they, they have their own web server. And of course, the Lazada website has many web pages uh, inside its website. Okay, next is we have the intranet. So intranet, it is a computer network for sharing information, collaboration tools, operational systems, and other computing services within an organization, usually to the exclusion of access by outsiders. So, an intranet as defined, I'll give you an example. Um, prior to the online enrollment of the university, I've already an experience re with regards to this one. So, since I, I, I held a position that needs to um, get information about students, so I, I asked for the permission of the administrator to let me install the enrollment system in my own personal computer so that I, I can still work at home. They allowed me to do that. Um, so I installed it in my own laptop. And then, of course, uh, when I'm at school, sometimes I'm bringing my, my own personal laptop. And then I used, it, I used the, the enrollment system. Of course, it's working. So the thing is, when I went home, and then I continued uh, the work at home, and then when I'm accessing the enrollment system, I cannot connect, I cannot uh, access the information. So uh, there is a message uh, that, that, uh, that they cannot access because I am, from, I am connecting from the outside network and not the network of the university. So enrollment system, that enrollment system works in, an, in the internet because it can only access uh, your, the information of the students if you are connected to the university um, network but if you're accessing it from the outside you cannot do so so that is already an example of an intranet so next is we have the extranet so an extranet is a controlled private network that allows access to partner vendors and suppliers or an authorized set of customers normally to a subset of the information accessible from an organization's intranet so the portals that are used, uh, for example, for us, uh, for us as faculty or for students, you can access your grades. So that is already a type of extranet. Okay, next is we have protocols. So a standard set of rules that allow electronic devices to communicate with each other. So for connections, there are many protocols. We have this uh, transmission control protocol or the... TCP, and then we have IP, the Internet Protocol. And then next is we have WebCentric. So it is an application or system that has been designed for the web, web rather. So that's why it's called WebCentric. So it must be con it must be accessed by a brow from a browser, and it has uh, it should have an internet connection. Okay, next is client. A desktop computer or workstation that is capable of obtaining information and applications from a server. So, client, as based on the definition, uh, for me, it's not just limited anymore with desktop computer or work workstation. Is This is any device that is capable of obtaining information or applications from a server. It does not restrict anymore with desktop computer. It can be your laptop. It can be your uh, smartphone or phones that can connect to the internet and access a web pages so that is already considered as a client okay next is we have server a server is a computer that provides data to other computers okay next is so so much with the internet uh, terminologies so next is connecting a database to the web database must be connected to the internet internet or intranet and it is uh, by means of a middleware we have an example of a middleware which is the adobe called fusion but there are also other middlewares available okay next is we have data security well-designed systems provide security at three levels so the database itself the web server 
and the telecommunication links that connect the components of the system. Okay, so next is we have the data design terminology. So we have this definition for entity. So um, not just the formal definition, I'll just give you uh, an example for you to understand an entity. So an entity can be a person, can be a place, can be things, can be events that has data in it. So for these examples here, so student, advisor, course, and grade table, these are called entities. And then all entities has its own table or file. So for students, we have student table, advisor table, course table, and grade table. So next is we have field. So field, for you to easily understand what a field is, field is just the columns of the table. So, student number is a field, student names is a field, total credits is a field, GPA and advisor number, these are all fields, all the columns. Okay? While the record, if field are the columns of a table, record are the rows. Meaning, if you have one, rec uh, if you have the, uh, one row, you already have one record of an instance of the uh, entity okay so record is the row field is column so it can be tuple okay we have these key fields okay so we have primary key candidate key foreign key and secondary key so let's tackle first primary key so let's go back with the table so primary key meaning that's why it's called primary this key can identify the entity uniquely. So let's have this student entity. So we have the field student number, student name, total credits, GPA, and advisor number. So from this table, can you name which of them is the primary key for the student entity or the student table? Okay. Will it be possible for student name? Okay, for student name, does this uniquely identify the student? Because, for example, here in the Philippines, we have a very common name which is called Juan de la Cruz. Okay, for Juan de la Cruz, how many persons in the Philippines has this name, Juan de la Cruz? If it's okay, if it's student name, if all the names are unique. But since Juan de la Cruz is a very common name, specifically Juan is a very common name here in the Philippines, so it should not be the primary key. Again, primary key, the, the, the identification of a primary key is that it can uniquely identify the entity. So student number, is it a primary key? So actually a student number, it is a primary key because... Example, here in our university, your student SR code is the student registration code. Is there any a possibility that there, there are two or more students with the same SR code? Of course, it's not possible. That's your unique identifier. Unless there is a glitch uh, while storing uh, or generating your SR code. So, for this example, for the student entity, your primary key is the student number because it uniquely identifies the student entity. Okay, next is we have the candidate key. So candidate key, these are the keys that to be considered as a primary key. So we have another one. Now let's go with the advisor table. So we have the advisor number and social security number. So actually. Social security number can also be uh, can can be classified as a candidate key because a candidate uh, candidate key it is said that it also uniquely identify the entity because the advisor table or the advisor entity 
uh, this can be uh, identified uniquely by using the social security number. But here in the example, why is it advisor number is used as the primary entity and not the social security number? It's because, of course, we have the entity advisor table. For example, in the university, it is more um, relevant to use the advisor number and not the social security number. So again, candidate key is, uh, these are the primary keys that you, uh, it, it, that's why it's called candidate. There are candidates for primary keys. Okay, next is we have the foreign key. So a foreign key, uh, this this key or this um, field, uh, this connects it from one table to another. So let's go back with the student table. So which of the following is a foreign key? And a foreign key, it's not, it's not just, it's not related, but um, it is, uh, it, it belongs to a different table. So for this, our foreign key here is the advisor number. So why is there a foreign key? That uh, database, um, database, there is a, another type, which is the relational database. So that the student table and advisor table will have a relationship. So that's why, example, your, uh, your grades. How is it possible? Again, you have 10 instructors and then they, uh, they uploaded the grades from a, from a class roster and how can you get your grades without even knowing the grades of your classmates of course just your grades it's because of this uh relational database that 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 that, that, that is the characteristic of the uh, database so that's there is a connection between the student table and advisor table for this example okay next is we have a secondary key so a secondary key is any um is any key actually it does not necessarily it's a primary it can be a um uh it's not uh, it can be a uh, not a unique code so secondary key what is the example of a secondary key example uh, you want to look for customers uh with the same province so by using the 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 code for the province you can already know the exact number of customers who are in that location so that um, province code that is already called the secondary key okay next is we have referential integrity so validity checks can help avoid data input errors so in a relational database Referential integrity means that a foreign key value cannot be entered in one table unless it matches an existing primary key in another table. Okay, so if there is a problem with that, then you will have an orphan. So let's go back with our example for the student table and advisor table. Okay, so since you have an advisor table as the foreign key for the student table, if you're going to input advisor number here the advisor number should be exactly the same with the advisor um, number here in the advisor table what if you put a value that is not existing in the actual advisor number so you will have that um, referential integrity so there will be an error that the number that you have entered in the advisor number is not existing so you have to check it uh, it's it's uh it's a bad uh, it's a bad habit. For example, that you entered in an advisor number that is not that is not really existing in the advisor table for its advisor number. So meaning why your database can check that the number that is entered is not existing in the actual advisor table. So for for an orphan, so we must also keep the connections. Because, for example, what if you changed the name of the table? So, for example, the advisor table, where will it connect? So, uh, there will be the so-called orphan. So, you must ensure that the relations of each tables are correct. Okay, next is we have the entity relationship diagrams or the ERD. 
So drawing an EID, the first step is to list the entities that you identified during the fact-finding process and to consider the nature of the relationships that link them. So the first step is list the entities based on the documentation or fact-finding uh, fact process that you have done. So basically, it requires, what if it is a documentation? It is a written document. So you need to analyze and understand the context or the situation of the uh, the descript uh, of the uh, for example of the company or any other the any other businesses that you want to uh, create an ERD. So you really need to understand to understand uh, really need to uh, analyze for you to understand the actual context or description of the situation. And then a popular method is to represent entities as rectangles and relationships as diamond, diamond shapes. So we have this an example. So what if in the documentation is we have this, a doctor treats a patient. So you identify the doctor and patient as an entity. Again, an entity can be a place, uh, things, people that has a data. So for doctors, you will have a data for, of course, their uh, who are the doctors in the hospital. So, you must consider it as an entity. And of course, patient. We have a number of instances or a number uh, list of patients in the hospital. So, this is also considered as an entity. So, since this, this uh, sentence is read as a doctor treats a patient, so, doctor treats, so, this is the relationship. So, relationships are written in verb form. Uh, doctor treats patient okay uh, next after you identified that entities and their relationships is you have to put the cardinality so three types of relationships can exist between entities is we have one-to-one -one relationship one-to-many relationship and many-to-many -many relationship uh, as I've already mentioned, entity relationship diagram is similar with class diagrams because they also use cardinality. But the difference is that class diagrams represents objects while entity relationship diagrams represent the entities. So we have an example here of an ERD. So is it, it is read as, just like the class diagram, one sales rep serves many customers or you can read it backwards of course if you read it in reverse you must change from active to passive voice so many customers many customers is served by one sales rep okay the next one customer places many order or many orders are placed by one customer and then Many order lists many products or many products is listed uh, to many orders. And then one warehouse stores many products or products are stored in one warehouse. So this is an example for this one. So for order and product, there is an existing entity that is um, uh, derived, which is order line. So that's why it is an associative entity. Okay, since I've already mentioned, just like the class diagram, ERD also has their cardinality. So cardinality notation, so the most popular notation that is used is the cross foot notation. Okay, this is the cross foot. Uh, why not bird? bird's foot notation but then anyway that it is called as a cross foot notation so it, if you're going to draw a bird this is their uh, foot okay then this is uh, included in the unified modeling language or UML now that you understand database elements and their relationship you can start designing tables so this is the entity then we have uh, two vertical lines so it is read as one and only one and then we have entity and then this is the symbol for many and then this is the symbol for one so one and only one so it is read one or many one or many okay do not interchange these two 
So, the cross foot notation must always stick to the entity. Okay? Uh, interchanging it will be wrong. And then another one, the entity, the symbol for many, and then the circle is zero. So, that's why zero or one or many or zero or more. And so, that's why zero, two, asterisk, and then one or more to asterisk. Okay, next is we have the entity and then one or zero. One or zero or zero or one. Again, do not interchange. This is the proper notation. If you're going to interchange it, it is wrong. Okay, so aside from drawing an ERD, we also have this normalization. So, for standard notation format, so designing tables is easier if you use a standard notation format to show a table structure, fields, and primary key. So, example, we have the table name and then field 1, field 2, field 3. So, field 1 has an underline because this field is the primary key. And then next is repeating groups and a normalized design. So, for repeating groups, open occur in manual documents prepared by users. So, this re uh, if there is a repeating groups in a table, so it is unnormalized. So, what we're going to do, enclose the repeating group of fields within a second set of parentheses. So, normalization has three, but uh, in, I already see there are four, for normalization form, for, for normal form, but for this uh, presentation, we have three. Okay, so first is we have the first normal form. So a table is in first normal form or 1 and F if it does not contain a repeating group. To convert for 1 and F, you must expand the table's primary key to include the primary key of the repeating group. So this is the unnormalized. So this is the, the table that is available from the user. So, we have uh, order number as the primary key and then you're going to identify another primary key for the repeating group for the product description and, of course, the number uh, ordered. Okay, next is we have the second normal form. A table is in second normal form or 2NF if it is in 1NF. And if all fields that are not part of the primary key are functionally dependent on the entire primary key. A standard process exists for converting a table from 1NF to 2NF. So the objective is to break the original table into two or more new tables and reassign the fields so that each non-key field will depend on the entire primary key on its table. It's like for normalization, it's just you're going to sort which of the fields are should be in a group. Okay, we have another one, the third normal form, or 3NF. Uh, this design avoids redundancy and data integrity problems that still can exist in 2NF design. So, a table design is in third normal form, or 3NF, if it is in 2NF, and if no non-key field is dependent on another non-key field. So, to convert the table to 3NF, you must remove all fields from the 2NF table that depend on another non-key field and place them in a new table that uses the non-key field as a primary key. So, for third normal is that a non, there, there should, uh, the non-key field must be dependent on the primary key and not on another non-key field. If you identify that there is a non-key field that is dependent on another non-key field. So, you have to, again, to sort it. So, that's why the non-key field must be dependent on the primary key. Okay, we have this normalization example. Actually, these tables are already uh, normalized because they are already grouped accordingly. So, for student advisor, and then for course and grade. So, for student, the fields are student number. This is the primary key. Then, student name, total credits, GPA, advisor number. So, it is connected to the advisor table. So, the fields of the advisor table is the advisor number and advisor name. So, it is written here in 3NF, no non-key field is dependent on another non-key field. So, for course, is we, the fields uh, included are the course number 
course description and number of credits. And then for the grade table is we have the student number, course number, and grade. Okay, next is, since we're already in the database or data design, using codes during data design is very important. So, overview of codes. Because codes often are used to represent data, you encounter them constantly in your everyday life. They save storage space and costs, reduce data transmission time, and decrease data entry time. And it can reduce data input errors. So, there are types of codes. So, we have seven. So, first is we have sequence codes. Okay, so an example of a sequence code is um, I graduated from a different university. So, my student number is already type of a sequence code. So, my student number is 2054-54307. So, it means that... Um, um, I am a first year college, still last year, 2000. And then the 54307 means that I am the 54307th um, applicant who took the exam in the uh, UPCAT. So that's, that's, that, that's the meaning of my student number. So actually, my neighbor, I, I, was, I, was, I just want to um, tell you this. Uh, actually, my neighbor, I was, I was surprised. Her number, her student number, we have the, we are this, uh, of the same age. It's also 2,054308. So it means, oh, it's not just the number of students, but also by location because we are neighbors. That's, that's, I real, that's what I realized when I knew her student number. Okay, next is we have the block sequence codes. So block sequence codes is an example are the subjects code for your subjects for example cpt 311 so we have cpt 311 meaning 31 uh, uh, starting with 3 it means it's for a third year subject while cpt 111 so it's starting with 1 meaning it's for fourth year uh, rather first year rather sorry and then for uh, cpt 212 2 means it is for second year so that is an example of block sequence codes next is we have alphabetic codes so example of alphabetic codes is for example for the provinces example um batangas not it's not bat bat because um there is bataan there is batanes if you're going to use bat it will be confusing so the the co alphabetic codes for batangas i think it's bts oh it's not the uh a very popular Korean uh, Korean uh, uh, boy band. So, it's BTS. So, for example, Rizal is RZL. So, so that is already an example of alphabetic codes. Uh, especially, of course, uh, the countries. For example, PH is Philippines, JP is Japan, KR is Korea, US is US of A. So, these are the alphabet, uh, examples of alphabetic codes. Next is we have the significant digit codes. So, significant digit codes are found in the postal codes. And then we have number five, derivation codes is we have voter's ID. So, um, I hope that maybe you just look at your own uh, voter's ID number. You can see that your voter's IDs consist of your initial, your, um, if I'm not mistaken, if I can remember it correctly, your initial, initials of your name, and then your, the year of your birth, and the present number. That is the, comp it's, uh, it's, uh, it, that's the composition, at least the basic composition of a, of a voter's ID. So, that is already an example of derivation codes because um, the codes are derived from the personal information of the, um, of the client or the customer. Okay, next is we have cipher codes. So, cipher codes, for example, if you're going to assign A is equal to 1, B is equal to 2, C is equal to 3, and then Z is equal to 25 or 26. So, and then you're going to use numbers, and then you're going to decode it. So, that is already an example of cipher codes. 
Okay, next is we have action codes. So, action codes depends on the information system. For example, um, if X is for delete and then uh, D is for display, so they have these codes for the process. That's why it's called an action code. So, again, it's dependent upon the culture or the information system that the um, that the uh, enterprise is using. Okay. Okay, for developing a code, so these are the simple rules to follow. So, number one is keep codes concise. As much as possible, don't make it longer than necessary. And then number two, allow for expansion. For example, um, you have five branches, five branches of your store. So, your... For example, it's 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03, 0, 04, and 0, 05. Okay. What if, for example, your code is, uh, you restrict it only to two digits? What if, in the long run, you will have 100 branches? So, will it 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03, 0, 04, and 0, 05 will suffice? No. So, if, if you can project that your branches will be over 100. So, I think your codes must allow for expansion. So, you should have three digits. Okay, number three is keep codes stable. So, for this one, so for companies, even after the update, um, the codes must still be the same. So, to avoid confusion from the end users. Okay, next is make codes unique, of course. So, for make codes unique, for example, HW. Does HW stands for hardware or houseware? So, you must have a uh, unique code for, for, for example, if your item is a houseware or hardware or anything. So, as not to confuse again the coding. And then, of, number five is use sortable codes. Because if your codes are sortable, it's easier to find and indexed. Um, okay, number six is avoid confusing codes. Okay, so that's why what if you're going to use capital letter O and zero or capital a small capital I and then small letter L. Uh, in some cases, there are more, uh, there are very, uh, you could not distinguish, especially a capital letter I and L. Unless your I, okay, unless your I is letter I, but what if your I is only this one? It will be confusing that it will be a distinguished as small letter L. Or your capital O, how can you distinguish it to zero? Okay, there is one technique for zero. That's why there are people, if they're writing this one, meaning this is zero and this is capital letter O. They're putting a slash inside uh, O to distinguish that this is zero and this is capital letter O. Okay, so next is we have make codes meaningful so example make code me, make make codes meaningful the alphabetic codes for provinces for for our for the country we have the ph so that is already uh, a very meaningful code for provinces and for countries and then number 8 is use a code for a single purpose so do not use a code to classify unrelated attributes and then number nine, of course, is keep codes consistent. If there is already an existing code that is used, do not create another one because, again, it will confuse the users who will, again, use the code. Okay, database design, one step at a time, is number one, create an ERD, uh, uh, rather, an initial ERD. Then next, create an ERD. So number one is more FA draft and then we have to finalize the ERD and then review all the data elements and then review the tree and F designs for all tables and then double check all data dictionary entries. After creating your final ERD and normalized table designs, you can transform them into a database. So 
for this example, actually, these two slides are uh, uh, in the book of Rosenblatt, the Systems Analysis and Design. So it is optional if you're going to um, uh, going to uh, enrich your knowledge. So we have this example. So imagine a company that provides on-site service for electronic equipment, including parts and labor. So this is this um, EID. So we have the entity for labor code, special labor detail, service parts detail, parts, and then service call, customer, and technician. So one labor code, then uh, its relationship is to, to the labor, special labor detail is many. Then one parts to many service parts detail. And then for service call, one service call to many serv service labor detail or one service call to service parts detail. And then many service calls to one customer and then many service calls to one technician. Okay, this is the relationship by means of a uh, table. Okay, next is, uh, this is uh, also related to the first slide as the additional exercise. So, again, to understand the power and flexibility of a relational database, try the following exercise. So, uh, the exercise is not part of this lecture. So, you can find it uh, with the book of systems analysis designed by Harry J. Rosenblatt. So, another situation uh, in the book. So, so you po suppose you work in IT and the sales team needs to answer three specific questions. It's already posted uh, actually in the book. So, there's already a, 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 key, uh, uh, a clue here. The data might be stored physically in seven tables. So, let's continue our discussion for data storage and access. So, data storage and access involve strategic business tools. So, strategic tools for data storage and access is we have data warehouse. So, this data warehouse, they have this dimension. For this example, the dimensions for the data warehouse is for the uh, for the company with sales information system and human resource information system accessing the data warehouse is the time period, the customer and the sales representative, and then data mark this uh, data mark. This are the um, units of the data warehouse, and then data mining. So what is this data mining? Actually, data mining is not new. The applications of data mining is why does the, for example, if you are in an e-commerce site, then you've searched for your favorite item, for example, clothing, um, dresses. And then when you, um, for example, when you uh, access another um, web page that has a website with, with advertisements from that store, uh, you can notice that the advertisement is personalized. It shows you um, advertisements that is related to the, to the search that you have done in the e-commerce website. For example, dresses. So that is already an example of data mining. It personalizes the experience of the user, for example, for using the, the uh, browser. Because if you've searched dresses, so since... Uh, they already identified that you as a client, you love dresses. Of course, if you love dresses, what will they give you? Will they give you what you want or you don't want? Of course, they will give you what they want, uh, what you want rather. So that's why dresses. So the, the ads, of course, are related to dresses. They will not give you an advertisement which is related to shoes unless you also search about the shoes so that is an example of data mining so the problem with data mining is um it may uh it may breach uh, the person's privacy the privacy issues of course it is uh of uh, how how extensive does this company um should get personal information for you so that is one issue of data mining Okay, we have logical and physical storage. So the differences between the two is for logical storage. So data is stored as characters, data element or data item, or a logical record. So for physical storage, so 
It is stored by means of a physical record or block, a buffer or blocking factor. So for data coding and storage, so we can use binary digits is by means of zeros and ones. We have a bit, of course, it is a group of zeros and ones, and byte is equal to eight bits. We can also use EBCDIC, e -B -C -C -B -I -C, or EBCDIC, the extended binary coded decimal interchange code. We have the ASCII, American Standard Code for Information Interchange, and binary. But the most extensive of all is by use of Unicode. So why is it the most extensive? Because it can, uh, for EBCDIC ASCII, they can only store English alphabets, the A to Z, while Unicode, it's not just the English alphabet, but then it can also store all the writings of other languages. It can store Chinese characters, it can store Japanese, we have the katakana and the hiragana. And then we have for the Korean characters or the hangul, or the, for the Thailand, for, for, the, for, 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 for Saudi Arabia. So they can store, Unicode can store. And actually, because it's very extensive, they're still empty, um, em, um, empty, uh, uh, empty, entries in the Unicode. Okay, next is we have storing dates is we have the Y2K issue. So I already discussed that um, storing dates now is we have the format MMDD then four Y's. Y, 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 Y. Not just uh, when it's still not yet year 2000, that year is only stored as two Y's. And then most date formats now are based on the model established by the International Organization for Standardization or ISO. And then we also have this absolute date. So absolute date, this is actually used in Excel. Um, dates are considered as numbers. So you can compute, for example, if you want to compute how many days has already elapsed from this date and up to this date, you can know the number of days dates because in Excel, they, uh, the dates stored as absolute dates. Okay, next is we have data control. So these are the types for controlling data in your databases by use of user ID, of course. If your user ID is administrator, so you can do anything. While, while if your user ID is a guest, that is you're using as a guest, you can only view the document. And then password, of course, it's also associated with a user ID. So, so to authenticate if you are really the administrator. And then, of course, permission is related for the user ID. For if you are, if you, if you have the user ID of the administrator, so your permissions are you can, uh, you can do anything. So if you're a guest, then. Your permissions are limited and it's just for viewing only. You cannot modify, you cannot delete, you cannot edit any entries in the data base. And then encryption, so for you to protect your data, it's not as to expose your raw data for hackers. And then, of course, you must back up your data. So, because backup and recovery comes hand in hand. If you do not have any backup, how can you recover the data if it is compromised so recovery procedures for it's from a backup or from the last saved from the last modification so these are the types of recovery procedures and audit log files of course is um, for audit log files um, you can know when was the data last updated who updated the file our list are authorized so these are the audit log files and the audit fields so audit fields, you must add such as timestamp. Um, when was the last, uh, it's related to audit log files. When was, was it last updated? And audit fields for who are the users who access the data and modify the data. Okay, so much. So this is already the summary. So files and tables contain data about people, places, things, or events that affect the information system. DBMS designs are more powerful and flexible than traditional file-oriented systems. An entity relationship 
or ERD diagram is a graphic representation of all system entities and the relationships among them. A code is a set of letters or numbers used to represent data in a system. The most common database models are relational and object-oriented. Logical storage is information seen through a user's eyes, regardless of how or where that information actually is organized or stored. Other, uh, uh, another is we have the physical storage is hardware-related and involves reading and writing blocks of binary data to physical media. File and database control measures include limiting access to the data, data encryption, backup or recovery procedures, audit trail files, and internal audit fields. So, we already finished with Chapter 9. So, I hope that you have learned something from Chapter 9, Data, data Design. And if you have any questions, feel free to comment below. And do not forget to subscribe to my channel. So, I hope that um, you've learned something from this. Uh, lecture. So thank you very much and good day to all of you.